Hi, welcome to today's Leaders in Mental Wellness and Diabetes, where you will hear insights from the top minds in the world of diabetes care, hosted by Dr. Shar. Hannah Lochner, she's a registered dietitian. She specializes in diabetes education and pump technology. And she's moving toward becoming a physician's assistant. Hannah, thank you for joining me today. Welcome to this podcast. Thank you for having me. I am from in Nashville today. Where in the world are you? I just moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin for school. So I just got to the Midwest. Previously, I was in New Mexico for the last few years. Oh my, oh my. Is the weather a lot colder? Yeah, it snowed today. <laughs> yeah, I forgot, I knew I was in Chicago for a suburb of Chicago for several years back in the day. And I remember Milwaukee having weather different than I expected anytime I asked. So I'm like, when I asked that, I'm like, New Mexico, Milwaukee, April. I was trying to think and it snowed. Yeah, totally different. I think it snowed in New Mexico too, but in Wisconsin, yeah, Milwaukee, it's it snowed today. I don't know. <laughs> well, I loved, loved, loved Chicago, even the weather I was used to it then. But then after spending 20 years in Florida after, I don't know if I could be taking a horse and carriage ride with that wind and that cold. Yeah. It's different. And Wisconsin, I mean, up in Milwaukee, it's that and more, right? It's so windy here. Cause you're right. Like, it's the same thing. You're right on the lake, but there's less, like, it's not built up as much as Chicago. So there's not as much berry, like, breaking of that wind and stuff so yeah but you have hardwood floors but I have hardwood floors <laughs> yes ma'am it is so nice to meet you are you a patient of diabetes the reason I'm jumping right into that is I love having casual conversations with today's leaders mm -hmm. I think if we if we know as patients those that treat us if we know them better we might be able to trust quicker and when they offer a methodology or offer a tool or offer us something we might quicker latch on to it because we're inundated with information it wasn't that case when i was diagnosed but we're inundated so i'm i'm grateful that you're willing to do this so i'm jumping right in with a personal question like are you a patient <laughs> Yeah. So I am living with type one diabetes. I got diagnosed when I was 19 and I was already studying nutrition. So it was this kind of like weird colliding of my life that I was going into and this new thing. And, and I'm sure that's, you know, definitely drew me into, to going into diabetes. And I'm very honest with patients. A lot of times I'll make recommendations like pre bolusing and I'll be like, I'm gonna be honest, like not something I'm very good at, but like, this is the gold standard and would help you. And I do think it helps to have that. Like, I get it. I'm also not perfect and I'm not expecting perfection from you. And we're going to figure out like what's going to work for you in that understanding of it. We can't be perfect all the time. I don't think the difference in our ages, I don't think it's about perfection and excellence as much as it is. I think we always knew we couldn't do it perfect, but we were kind of almost expected to keep up a good front. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say, I knew how to wear a mask long before there was a pandemic. Because when you're diagnosed, if you don't want, like if I would cheat, I'm sure I'm the only one that's ever cheated on a meal. And, but if you were to ever eat something, even if it was because your sugar was low and somebody who happened to walk by that knows your situation, whether they feel or think a thing, it's easy for the patient to want to explain. Now, if I'm the only one in the world, okay. But it's almost like we were taught a standard of just don't tell your vulnerabilities. And since Breen Brown, and is it Breen Brown? What's her last name? About yeah. vulnerability. It's like, oh yeah. And so that's the kind of things that's good to hear you say. I can say to my patient clearly, well, I don't do it the greatest, but boy, this is a good standard for both of us to grow into. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally I agree. And I think as technology has progressed, a lot of 
what my patients come to me is that they're expected, they are expected to never venture from this like gold standard, which, you know, as living people living with diabetes, there's not a gold standard. We all have individual lives. We have so many things intersecting in our treatment. Navigating healthcare is a totally different world once you have a diagnosis, but navigating the world is too. And they, you're not going to have one path that works for someone. And there's sometimes this idea from providers and outside, I'm gonna call outsiders, people who don't live with type one or even diabetes, they, they don't get that. They're like, there's one set thing. It's going to work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, that's, that's a your problem. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, that might be on the suggestions problem. That might just be a bad recommendation. Like there's so many other things there. So I agree. And we have to create a space where everyone can be honest because as a provider, I can't make recommendations if I don't know what's happening. And as a patient, my providers can't make recommendations if I'm not being honest either. And so, yeah, that trust, that place of not having to have a mask on, so important when you walk into a room with an educator or honestly anyone. It's exhausting to wear a mask. <laughs> and it's good. It is exhausting. And it's good to, whether it's invisible or visible, it's exhausting mm -hmm. with a visible one we know now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also exhausting with an invisible one mm -hmm. because. I don't think any of us, and probably the providers never meant for us to measure to perfection, but we just didn't feel the liberty to say it's less than without feeling the guilt and shame. Yeah. And so in when, when someone says control the numbers, I get what they mean, but that's... I, I don't want to say that's easier said than done, but is that even something in our total control? You know, like yeah. we, there are many, many things that we have to do that we can't let ourselves off of the hook and say, well, it's not all about the numbers. Well, it is a lot about the numbers. But, you know, when you think of it in the terms of a one, a one -er, to you, I can do the best I can do. And sometimes my number doesn't justify that. I, I don't even use control anymore in my verbiage. It's been removed. You will never see that in a chart note. You will never see like patient is controlling numbers or anything like that. Cause I can't control the weather and it gets super hot out. My blood sugars change. So I can't control that. That's outside of my control. What I can do is engage and manage with the tools that I have to a adjust what I'm doing in that moment to address the blood sugar change to the heat, but they're still going to do what they're going to do. And then I have tools to say, okay, I need a little more insulin, or I need a little bit more water, or I, you know, need to go meditate for five minutes. Cause I'm getting anxious, whatever it is. I have these tools to address the numbers changing, but I'm not controlling them. I'm working with my surroundings. I'm engaging with the changes and I'm, I'm doing my best to manage. And so I do talk to a lot of like the primary care providers I work with, or the, I work in a residential eating disorder treatment center. I talk to them a lot about, we're not controlling anything. We're, we're managing and we're engaging. And that's, it's a very, to me, it's very different than that language on both sides. Well, I like the word influencing. The reason I think I can influence like anxiety right now is my go-to because I'm building a program on reversing anxiety. So if you look at that right off and don't go through the whole process, you think I, I'm saying you can never have anxiety. No, I'm saying anxiety can come 50 times a day if it wants to. Feelings that lead to it like worry and fear and all those things can come anytime they want to. But we can reverse the anxiety part according to our behaviors, but I don't even start on the behavior side. I start on the change the belief. If mm -hmm. I change the belief in the operating system, then the behaviors and actions are sustainable that I work toward. So it's a, I think we can influence our feelings. I'm the boss of them. They're not the boss of me, but I think we can influence numbers and I think a good balance of understanding that, because when I hear patients, you get a lot of information online, right? 
So you can hear a lot of people talk about, I don't even look at my numbers. And the reason is I'm the same person you are. Well, that's true, but a balance because there are some things where honesty comes into play that I have to recognize 200 opportunities for me and you to eat a day can be ignored by somebody that's not a type one -er in a different way than we can ignore it. Yeah. It's just, absolutely. it's just the way it is. So I get that you're type one and we wouldn't blame you if you were started down a nutrition path and you said type one, I am going to deal with this. I'm certainly not going to talk about it my whole life. How did you continue that path? What got you into helping our community? Yeah. So I actually originally was like, absolutely not. I am, I am not going into type one. I had a ton of medical trauma with my diagnosis and a lot of not great doctors and people giving me advice that influenced me in not a very positive way. And so I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'll use my knowledge to do like group education, maybe around diabetes, but not specifically type one. And then I went into my internship and it just, it felt like home. I was like in my rotation with the diabetes clinic at um, Oregon Health and Science University. And I mean, it just was like, I could interact. It was so natural for me. Even as a student, I knew I was like supporting and we were making change and I was building rapport with patients in a way that I didn't feel in my other rotations. And so at that point I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do it. I love it. It's, it, it fulfills me as much as I'm supporting someone else. And so then I just kind of, I went with it. Um, and I thought really hard about like how I want that to look. And it wasn't necessarily in an endocrinology office. I ended up going into primary care so I could have a variety of things, but specialize in type one in a rural area that doesn't have endocrinologists. So it's a little different. My education position is not necessarily like in the endocrinology clinic, you see your endo, then you see me. Where I'm I was out before moving was you'd come into your primary care as someone with type one who may drive six to eight hours to see an endo and you would meet with me and I could support the endo and your primary care so that you don't have to travel. You might travel once a year instead of four times. You might, I might do all your pump stuff under your primary care and just communicate to your endo that we're doing this. And you just see them to make sure the other things that need to happen, or some patients just actually went fully managed by primary care. And it was just me and their primary care doing that just to remove the burden of like, there was no resources. There was no pump trainers. There was no, there was no one who understood type one. And I could fill that gap in this tiny, it's not tiny, this mid-sized town that really doesn't have any, anything around for you to manage without really traveling and talk about like a barrier when you have to drive at least five hours round trip just to see your endo, you're not necessary. There's a large chance you're not going to be able to go for whatever reason. And so I kind of filled that gap and then decided to go to PA school so I could go back and fill that gap again, just as a prescribing provider. So, so that's yeah. where you're going to go back to into that. I'm, I'm going to go back and rural healthcare will be what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Probably not endo, which always surprises like my own endos and everyone else who talks to me, but it would probably be primary care with this specialization in type one and diabetes to be able to help in those areas. That is awesome. That is awesome. I was raised in rural America where a good hospital is still 30 minutes to an hour away. I watched my grandmother do what she knew to do for diabetes. I watched her drink four, she would drink four ounces, a little tiny glass of milk and a sleeve of graham cracker for her bedtime snack as she was losing limbs, as she was losing a piece at a time. But see, it wasn't, it wasn't a medical society not, not not trying. Back then it wasn't even known, you know, they were doing the best they could. But you couldn't make me sit down with a graham cracker and a four ounce cup of milk for my nighttime snack because we know better today, right? Right. But yet still the care is a drive. 
it's a distance. So not only do you have possibly an economic situation, Mm -hmm. you also have this huge drive. And the good thing about all that is everybody everywhere, primarily, or at least in where I'm from, they have a phone and they have access to internet. Go figure. Is that that rural area where you're used to working? Do they have access to those things? I feel like I had a student and she told me the percentage. I think the percentage that had like smartphones and I'm, I could be off with something like 60 to 70% had smartphones. So they, most of them had phones, but not necessarily like a smartphone where video or any capa- you know capacity there. And most people did have internet, but not necessarily computers. So I, it's like this weird thing where there's everything in New Mexico is very spread. The state's 80% rural. So there's only like three actual places that are considered metropolitan. And the you may have internet, but it's very sparse. It's not always great connection because they're not serving as much in those areas when you don't have a densely populated, you know, you know, way of living. It's, it's a lot more spread. It's harder for them to bring those resources there. So yes, potentially they have phones. A lot of them have the phones from the government at this point, but it's, there is a lot of poverty and it does play a role. And then the resources are less because we don't bring resources often to rural areas because it doesn't, affect as large of the population so it's not as worth time to to do that in some ways I don't agree with that but that's often kind of the rationale is if it's only going to affect 20 people for me to bring this here why would I do that when I could bring something here and affect millions and you're like well those 20 people still are people Um, so well just recently during this wartime I have spoken to some Ukrainian women and to realize that even in a time with technology, when they would have to turn it off and have no sound listening for bombs or listening for sirens, on those kind of moments, having to turn off and the silence, we're so used to the music, we're so used to the technology, the silence was deafening and it was very hard for some younger women in that setting and that's in addition to everything else that was happening at least where you are in rural in the rural setting they're not accustomed to it they're not used to it so they get a doctor or a nurse practitioner that's going to travel from town to town there's almost there's almost a warmth to that and the learning and what you can do and the difference. I know I'm sounding like I'm trying to make a Hallmark movie, but you can really make an impact and a difference today in a world where our society might just count them out because there's not enough for this much expense where a million reasons why they're still in that setting. So thank you and God bless you for all you're doing. Well, thank you. Yeah, I will always advocate for rural health care. It is some of the most fulfilling moments that you can have. And I am so grateful that I took that jump when I was like, what am I doing? I live in Portland, Oregon, like where I'm gonna go. I'm so grateful I went rural because really, like I said, I'm not, the rest of my life, I know I'm gonna serve rural areas. There's, it's just fulfilling in a way I can't explain. And people are so grateful often because it's like, it's you or it's no one else. So there's a lot of like, we want you to stay. We're gonna do what we can to make sure you stay. and. I think, I don't know. It's just a very, it's an interesting world. Well, tell me, tell me how in that kind of a setting, tell me how anxiety shows up for your patients differently. Oh, that is a great question. Um, I mean, I, what in like the way it presents physically or like what triggers the anxiety? Well, I guess both, but for instance, if I have a low blood sugar, I love, not that I have type one diabetes, but I love that I have experienced enough to when I'm talking to others, I get it. Mm -hmm. And when I am doing some reparative work with a couple, because she gets hateful as can be, I can literally talk about when your low is low, you're not in control of that. But when your low 
is normalized. Now, if you've let your mood become more anxious or grumpy or fearful or hateful, now it's your privilege, obligation, and responsibility to get that back, get that off your shoulder and get that off the loved one that you're with. And now we're doing good marriage counseling because of what something happened around anxiety that started with a low. That's kind of the world I live in. Yeah. So how does it show up for people that have traveled to see you and that when they have lows, what do they do? If they don't have a, if they don't have a monitor to tell them at three in the morning, they're 31. Tell me, tell me about that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is a lot of different planning in that sense, because the anxiety can be so much because if, you know, someone, one of my older type ones or older type twos who are on medications that can cause lows has a low somewhere where it takes over an hour and a half for an ambulance to get there. There is a lot of anxiety around that, the idea of going low, like this person may never have gone low. Even actually they could be type two and have meds that won't even create low blood sugars, but the anxiety is so great that someone can't get there, that they will do everything to prevent it before it even happens, mm -hmm. which then you're living at a state of anxiety that's up here. And so things will kind of present like the anxiety of the thing that potentially could happen that I couldn't get out of because I'm so far away or I don't have a car. That's very common. Like I live kind of rural. I'm in a far away place. I have no car. So if something happens in my house, I have no escape plan. And so I have this like whole level of anxiety that I planned my way out of there and not even diabetes like related. Like I have just a plan to how I would get out of my house without a car when I don't live anywhere close to on my end. It's a lot of just a lot of education and a lot of tools. And that's where a lot of technology came in. Like, I will get you on a sensor that alarms you so we never get there, but we can't live at 250 so that you don't go down to 60. Like we, neither one are healthy. We have to find this balance and we have to push that hypoglycemia phobia in a way that is still safe. But what's our plan? Like you go low, there's something by your bed. You don't leave your bed. It's right there. You always have a meter right there. I will make sure I give you a sample meter that doesn't leave your bed and it's there just for when that moment happens. And it's a lot of just almost like emergency preparedness. That's um, good. Well, if, if 80% of what we worry about never happens any, there's a way to help people understand like stress, we are created for emergencies. Our bodies are made to handle those. Now I'm not talking about physically when the, you know, that, yeah. that takes food to handle <laughs> that. Right. But I'm talking about pulling yourself out of that or not living in that anticipating the negative day ar day's arrival. So yeah, that's, that is uh, skill training instead of therapy, like right. I traditionally was taught but my doctorate's in education. So it's always been a good blend for me. And I think good um, skill training is, is so imperative. So it sounds like as a primary care give a, a provider, you do all those things. You become that mental health stabilizer. You become that pump, director whether they have pumps or not yeah. and you you become that stabilizer in all those fronts i'd love to go with you someday just oh i'd love yeah. to go visit and, uh, and we have a good team so i don't want to make it sound like there's not a team there's i the clinic i worked at had a lot of we have a lot of specialists including mental health specialists and things like that and in some ways there was a lot of training for me to them on like this is the life you know these are things that you may, it was the same with eating disorders. Like you might not have been trained directly in this, but I'm going to give you my background here to help you take your special aid and, and become that specialist for them too. So yeah, I do a lot, but I, I do have a team. I don't want to say I'm like the only person on the team. There is definitely a lot of us trying to create it. I might be the center of the education in one, a lot of what times, but I'm not alone. Luckily. Well, and here I go making that Hallmark movie again, <laughs> just seeing you out 
in this little <laughs> rural town, making yeah. it all happen for everybody. So if you were to be able to tell somebody newly diagnosed either type one, type two, one and a half, somebody's just diagnosed with diabetes, what would be one of the things you would sell, tell your younger self when that 19 year old girl was given that news? Give us one bit of help. I, I think what I would, you, you know, what I would say and what I would say to myself is like, you have a chance to reinvent yourself with something new and, and reinventing and change is messy and it's hard and it's not perfect, but like you get, you get to choose what comes out that other side and you're going to change and you have the, you find the tools to make it for the better. You know, I found a career that I love from it and I'm a person I love from it. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without type one. And there are times when it sucks and it's hard, but like, I, I got to choose this person that I became that also included having type one. And I think everyone, no matter the type of diabetes or medical diagnosis you get, you get to become someone new and you, you have the power to decide who that new person's going to be. Oh, that is so good. That means when a voice inside your head wants to be a bully or wants to be a victim or wants learned helplessness, as hard as some days are and nobody chooses diabetes, you are a, such a good example of the other side of that creating somebody creating something out of, I wish I had said this, making lemonade out of lemons. Wouldn't yeah. that have been good right there if I'd have made that up? Yeah, and we'll give that to you and say that's your phrase. <laughs> Never heard it before. <laughs> Can you tell I'm not from uh, Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> there comes a point and age where you don't care. You just don't, yeah. as long as my, I try to add the INGs on my words and the more familiar I get with you, the less they, the less they stay. It has been a joy to meet you. I really, really hope you do well in school. How long is that path? It's 28 months of school and then I'll sit for my boards. And then, and then once that, that boards is done, then I can start practicing as a PA. So yeah, probably in the end a little bit longer but and so you're mm -hmm. anticipating after your boards that's when you anticipate going back yes I'll go back once I pass I'll go back to the same clinic I, I just left from yeah so amazing will you keep in touch with me like yeah you'll remember me Absolutely. but I, I would <laughs> love I would love to follow your path where can we reach you now if we want to see what you're doing? I share my diabetes journey, my MS journey, and my just life journey on Instagram. Diabetes, but it's spelled super weird. So at D-I-A-B-E-A-T-I-E-S. And that is really where I post my whole, you know, everything that I go through as a patient, as a person, as a student, as a professional, it's all on there. And so that's where you can kind of follow my journey. Meaning I beat this thing. I beat it. I did. <laughs> and I ate a lot doing it because also got the word eating it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. It's nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you ever need me, I would do everything I could to make it happen. Thank you. It was so nice talking to you and meeting so, you. So good right. to see you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.